And my name is Phil Dukorski and I'd like to welcome you here today on behalf of Research Board and our team. Uh, I think this is a, an important issue and probably one of the most contentious issues that uh, is facing South Australia at the moment. So it's a great opportunity to inform yourself and uh, perhaps stabilise or finalise your position with regard to that. So before we start, as is normal in most resources type activities, there's a couple of things that I'd like just to touch base with. And that is uh, the safety um, procedures and facilities. So the, uh, the standard um, whoop whoop, sorry, I'll start again. The alert signal is a beep beep beep. And that will indicate that there's uh, some sort of an activity where an evacuation may be required. Exits are written behind you where you came in the door and across the foyer there's exits onto the, uh, onto the promenade and walk out the front there. If the alarm progresses to the whoop whoop whoop, there's an uh, evacuation required and you obviously should leave immediately and uh, calmly. There will be staff that help you to do that. Um, can I ask you to turn off mobile phones uh, at the moment or put them on silent? And, uh, if you need the facility, you should go out the door and turn to the right of the legs and then uh, uh, around that. So, uh, importantly this morning, we would like to acknowledge that this is the land that, the land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Kaurna people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Kaurna people as the custodians of the Greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still of importance to the living Kaurna people today. I'd like to particularly welcome our guest of honour this morning, um, his, his, the former Royal Commissioner. Sorry, he's had so many titles in his uh, illustrious career that I'm a bit stumbling about that. The former Royal Commissioner, Kevin Scarce, who will speak to us later, and I'll give you a brief moment on that. But before, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And as you all know, events like this are impossible to run without the support of organisations like DMAW in terms of waters. So we have two principals from DMAW with us today. Julia Dinskiansky, who's over here, a corporate and commercial lawyer specialising in mining, energy and native title law. In 2007, she attended the International School of Nuclear Law course of Montpellier University and has spoken on nuclear and uranium mining legal issues at international conferences and locally. Recognised for her expertise on nuclear law and international networks, Julia has mentored and supervised master students and is a trusted advisor in this field. Paul Duggan leads the workplace law team at the MAW and advises on full industrial dispute management, transfer of business, work, health and safety, discrimination, bullying, harassment, dismissal and workers' compensation matters. Paul is also in a wide range of industries, including mining and resources, mining services, waste management, health, energy, and water management. There are a number of other people from the uh, EMAW here this morning also that uh, I think you might have an interest in talking to. So um, that's just a brief introduction. Food should be coming out now. Uh, and uh, I'll let you continue with your networking for a little while, while and I'll come back at uh, 7.30 and introduce um, the Honourable Kevin Spears. Formally, thank you. Naval Training and Naval Support Commander. 
There are also specialised in military logistics and procurement, rising to the range of rear admiral and head of maritime systems at the Defence Material Organisation. After retirement as head of the South Australian Defence Unit, he led a government team that contributed to AFC within the contract to build the air war for destroyers for the South Australian Defence for the Australian Defence Force. Kevin was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross in 1994, the Knight of Grace in the Federal Order of St John in 2007, and a Companion of the Order of Australia in 2008. Rear Admiral Scarce completed the Bachelor of Financial Administration from New England, New England Master for Management, Economics at the University of New South Wales, Australian Defence Force Academy campus, and a Master's Degree in National Security Strategy at the US War College and National Defence University in Washington, D.C. He was awarded an honorary doctorate from Flinders University in 2009 for distinguished service to the public of South Australia and an honorary doctorate of letters, honoris causa, from the University of New England in 2014. In addition to his role as the 16th Chancellor of the University of Adelaide, Rear Admiral Scarce was recently appointed Chair of County Council of South Australia and President of Navita Children's Services. He is the director of a number of public and private companies, a governor of the Cooper's Foundation, and a joint patron with his wife Liz of Angie Care SA. Kevin was appointed on the 29th of March 2015 as the Commissioner of the Nuclear Royal Commission of the Nuclear Fuel Cycle Royal Commission. Would you welcome to the stage Kevin? Good morning. Incredibly early. Um, <laughs> in about 20 to 25 minutes, I thought I'd just run through <coughs> the major findings of the Royal Commission and then get down to questions. Um, if there are any difficult questions, I've brought my uh, Chief of Staff, Greg Ward, uh, here so Greg can come up and answer them. <laughs> what do we talk about? Uh, when, we, when we're thinking about a Royal Commission into nuclear fuel. Well, what we are asked to do is to assess whether there were opportunities, costs and risk to expanding our participation in the nuclear fuel cycle. We already participate in mining and milling, so the question through a lens of opportunity, cost and risk to the environment, to the community, and to the economy, we were asked to make and report on whether it made sense to process the mined uranium through conversion and enrichment and uh, fuel fabrication into a power source. That was the second term of reference. Uh, whether it made sense to generate electricity from that power source, that was the third term of reference. And the fourth was to dispose uh, of waste. And sorry, I should have mentioned the first was, should we expand our uranium mine? So what did we find? Uh, the process for the Commission took about uh, 13 months. We notice came, um, none of the seems and came with a view about uh, the nuclear industry. I certainly didn't know a lot about it. We needed to uh, to engage with those who did. We did uh, tours throughout Asia, um, Europe, the US. We had a series of about 140 experts um, uh, in a public session. All of this was uh, put into our website. Uh, we released a tender findings document which indicated how we were thinking and provided uh, an opportunity for the community to comment on those tender findings and the final report was released on the 6th of May. Let me just briefly go through the findings. Uh, in terms of mining, we found that that was a valuable uh, industry for the state, that the administrative and regulatory framework was satisfactory uh, for the continuation and the expansion of mining, that there was good prospect, um, that there were other sizable uranium deposits out there, and a series of recommendations on how we might make the most of uh, continuing to explore the uranium. But even if we were successful and doubled 
in our know, uranium um, that we produce, it might take uranium from three to four hundred million dollars to seven to eight hundred million dollars. So it was not a significant impact on the economy of the state, but it's still an important impact. The second part was taking that uh, um, uranium that we mine and mill and converting it into a power source through conversion, enrichment and fuel fabrication. Following Fukushima, we found that the commercial market is oversupplied in these services by about 20%. Commercially, it would not make sense to participate in those activities at this particular time. However, if we sorted out the back end of the process, the disposal, is a process which is broadly referred to as fuel leasing, which enables you not to sell your uranium you produce, but to lease it and take it back. If that were possible, then it provided the sort of comparative advantage that you would need to enter that market. Why is that important? Well, because it's jobs and technology. So the processing side of it brings a lot of technology into the state. It provides additional jobs. But it is, at this stage, commercially uh, unviable. The third part was to talk about generation of electricity from a nuclear fuel source. Now, the characteristics of the South Australian market um, play into the final conclusion that it wasn't commercially viable for South Australia to enter into the generation of electricity from fuel sources, uh, nuclear fuel sources at this time. But in the back of our mind, um, particularly halfway through our study, uh, the Paris Accord, where 196 nations decided that they would take action to reduce carbon emissions to keep temperature below two degrees, a two degree increase in pre-industrial um, uh, achievements, there, there is a significant challenge for the nation as we think about how we might constrain future carbon emissions from power generation. We are, per capita, the most intensive polluters in the world. We also know that by 2050, we will need to take carbon emissions from electricity generations from about 30 to 40% at the moment, down to zero. Now, how we get there is certainly something that um, hasn't been discussed in detail at this stage. The government is due to look at it in 2017. Um, we found that there was no reason why we should not have that technology available to us. We did not conclude that it made sense for Australia. But what we said was the technologies that uh, we are embracing at the moment won't get us to zero emissions by 2050 and that we need to think about energy policy in the future of which nuclear might be an option. But for South Australia, because of the significant amount of renewables, it made no economic sense to have a large nuclear power generator in the system. It couldn't uh, it couldn't make its way in terms of uh, revenue. That all sounds pretty negative. When we get to, to the final term of reference, um, we took a lot of time to look at what was happening overseas for the disposal of used fuel. We visited uh, Finland, um, France, Canada, the US, to look at uh, and Switzerland and Belgium to have a look at uh, how they were managing the disposal of used fuel. We conclude that it can be safely stored based upon the technology that's currently available and the processes that other nations 
are engaged in and that it would bring significant financial benefit to the state. The important thing to consider in this particular term of reference is always safety. That was the first thing that we looked at. Put this in context, I just want to explain what was modelled for the Commission so that we could come up with an economic term of reference. So the facility that we envisage was to have a purpose-built port, a dedicated uh, road to an interim storage facility. Why an interim storage facility? That enables you to collect revenue uh, whilst you're building your deep geological storage. Rail transport to the deep geological storage site and at that deep geological storage site there'd be infrastructure to enable you to dispose of fuel. So that's the prospect of how you might do this. Clearly uh, it was not part of the permanent reference for the Commission to decide where that activity, activity might be. Um, that's a process that happens after you've got um, the consent that you need from the community to progress. I want to talk about the most important thing in this is safety. It's very important to understand the characteristics and the radiotoxicity of the used fuel. The detail here is not important, but the graph shows you what happens to radiotoxicity over time. As it comes out of uh, the reactor, it generally spends about 10 years in, uh, in a pool cooling. It's then taken out of the pool and uh, put in casks where it's open uh, to the environment for about 40 years. And all of this, the first 50 years, is to take sufficient heat out of the used fuel so that you can eventually dispose of it. So that first 50 years, the radiotoxicity, as you can see, um, it loses out 60% of the radiotoxicity in that first 50 years. In the first 500 years, you lost about 75%. And by that I mean, that um, the uranium decays. It decays with time, and as that decays, you're left with the persistent transuranics or the, the difficult um, radiotoxicity elements that remain. And they're generally uh, plutonium and mericium. Now, whilst there are trace elements of these um, Transuranics, they are still critical to keep safe. And so, whilst the radiotoxicity reduces significantly, there are still trace elements that need to be managed and managed carefully. The importance of this is the way that you dispose of the fuel. I don't know whether we've got that slide, we haven't. Um, so, what happens um, typically and I'll refer to the examples in Finland, which is the most advanced at the stage. Uh, they'll dispose of their waste uh, at about 420 to 450 metres. They'll put it, they'll encapsulate it in a 5 centimetre um, out case of copper. They'll put the used fuel within a steel container uh, within that copper. And that will keep the fuel contained for anywhere between 1,000 to 10,000 years. Now, all of this is not the guesswork. All of this has been developed by the proponent and cleared by Stuck, the Finnish regulator. And how do they do that? Well, they've been uh, in an underground laboratory for the 
20 to 30 years doing tests. Uh, they know through looking at uh, archaeology the impact of copper over time and they have convinced the regulator that you can um, keep the used fuel from the environment for that period of a thousand to ten thousand years. And when you look at this, this graph, what we're really interested then is about one and a half percent, one and a quarter percent of the radiotoxicity of the original fuel package remains. And again, that's generally plutonium americium, americium. And when you store uh, the used fuel in those containers, it's, it's put in a hole, it's packed with um, bentonite clay, and the bentonite clay prevents water ingress and prevents, what well, hinders I should say rather than prevents, and hinders radio um, toxicity coming out of the canister. And in any case, both plutonium and americium cling to clay as they leave the canister, and inevitably it will fail. And so there are, uh, they are convinced that the fuel that is stored for those periods uh, will stay within the containers for the first thousand to ten thousand years, and then will migrate very slowly uh, in periods beyond those ten thousand years to about two to three hundred thousand years, when the elements really match the surrounding environment, so the radiotoxicity mimics what is in the original rock. How do they prove this? Well, uh, there's an enormous amount of modelling that's uh, associated with proving both the canisters will uh, remain intact and uh, the time periods for which <coughs> they will eventually corrode. Each of the countries that we visited at the top of the facility, they have regulated uh, maximum amounts of uh, uh, radioactivity of 0.1 of a millisievert. So that's the maximum amount the most exposed member of the public is allowed to have in that particular site. And remember that background radiation is generally 1.7 to 2.5 millisieverts. So this is a very, very small amount. And then they'll do worst case scenarios of, uh, and they'll need to prove to the regulator that if uh, a shear occurs or someone drills in to the canisters or the canisters fail earlier than expected, they will still need to prove that at uh, the top level, at the ground level, the radiotoxicity will not exceed that particular limit of 0.1 of a millisecond. So there's a, there's a science attached to proving that this is safe for the community. In Finland, the site that they have chosen in Okluto is above a lake. Uh, one of the lakes uh, and it's about 20 kilometres from a town of uh, five to 10,000 people. If we were to do that, <coughs> these are the sorts of uh, figures that have been modelled. I think we've taken a very conservative view on, uh, on the revenue. We've added additional cost for um, contingencies and for optimism, public optimism. We provided around $32 billion as a fund uh, to manage the facility once it's closed. We also think it's important because of the um, the length of period, hundreds of thousands of years, that the funds go into wealth funds so they can protect it for future generations. 
We did some modeling um, of bringing the revenue into a state wealth fund, um, investing that at a 4% rate of return, keeping half of the principal, so, sorry, half of the, um, the income generated from the investment, and it runs to about over $445 billion over the 70 year life of the program. That would also enable you to spend one to two billion dollars of that income per year. Now that's very much based upon the principle of a separate port, all the costs and the opportunities. So this can be significant for the community. The challenge is, is not so much the technical issues, the challenge is what we would call the social consent to enable this process to proceed. What does the community think about that process? In the final report, we made uh, a chapter on going through in some detail what we think the process might be to engage the community. Um, and that process uh, has commenced now with the establishment of a, uh, a separate group and a separate advisory board. Um, and I expect in the next weeks they'll be a bit more fulsome on their intent of how they intend to engage the community. Uh, a process, a time, and uh, specifically what they intend to engage upon. This report covers the four terms of reference. Um, that's an awful lot for any community to chew. I think you need to zero in on the areas and waste is clearly the area I think that we need to spend most of our time on. Um, this is not just an issue for South Australia. Presently, federal law and regulations prevent us from doing any of this, as well as state legislation. So we will need uh, to work with the federal government uh, to take those regulations uh, and amend them so that these facilities or these activities can be contemplated. The second uh, important point is client nations need to be engaged. Now at the moment we've certainly been around the world and talked to nations that are interested in this prospect. Um, most of the transfer of used fuel between nations is, is governed by international law, international regulations. So any part of this process that takes spent fuel into the state needs to be in lockstep with the Commonwealth. We won't be able to do it by ourselves. Um, we had good support from the Commonwealth during, uh, during the review and uh, I don't see that that would change. Clearly, a bipartisan support is going to be critical at both state and federal level. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, the opposition's view is at this particular time. Um, I think that's part of the engagement process uh, moving beyond the federal election is to have that sort of discussion. Because clearly, because of the time frames, if we don't have um, bipartisan support, it's very difficult to move this process forward with any degree of certainty. And the final thing I would mention is there's enormous cost to providing this infrastructure. We considered that it was important to have a pre-commitment before you made uh, any start on the infrastructure. We've worked with some of the modeling to look at how much fuel that would be, and it's about 15,500 tonnes. We wouldn't uh, be recommending that you start down this track unless you had a pre-commitment from interested nations of about uh, 15,500 tonnes, um, so that you wouldn't be uh, funding any of this activity from a state perspective. And just keep in mind that uh, 
currently there's about 200, sorry, 350,000 tonnes of used fuel in the world at the moment. And by 2090, that will go to about a million tonnes. So we're looking for a fraction of that. The capacity that we model is about 138,000 tonnes. So there are ways of progressing this if the community supports it. I think I'm happy to take
then it'd be a hell of a lot easier places to get to than the middle of South Australia. You know, in fact, it's just the risk that I saw that it, uh, you've covered off a lot of them. Then I thought, well, okay, so what if things don't go to plan? So thanks for the answer. Yeah, it's in the back of uh, the report. There's a section on security, but it is broad. I'll be the first to admit. Thank you. Um, here at the back. Um, while the microphone's making its way, um, a number of people have asked questions around how you actually engage with us during the community and commented on the lack of understanding and lack of information. Now, the Commission itself and the report is you know, a contribution to that. Whereas Andrew Cully from Deloitte, um, Andrew White, Sue Rowland is um, we're sort of wondering how do you think you break that barrier of getting beyond people's emotional response to it and actually <coughs> develop a better understanding? Well, I think you spend time. Uh, there's no easy way around this. Um, we did a lot of town hall meetings and I don't think anybody came away um, better informed. I think you need to spend time in the community. I see the Premier made an announcement uh, on the weekend about uh, getting out to towns and communities. I think you simply have to spend time with the community, going through those graphs, explaining it, taking their questions, um, at no stage should we be underselling the risk here. We should be explaining the risk and how that risk is managed and how international communities have convinced their own community that the risk can be managed. The processes of developing the safety cases, of assuring ourselves that the copper canisters in the ground, the five centimetre thick copper canisters, will actually last the distance. Uh, and that's going to take time. You've got to have that, uh, that discussion. Where these processes have failed internationally is because more effort's been placed on the technical solution rather than the social solution. So it's simply a matter of having this team get out and engage with the community. I have to say, um, a topic that would resonate with everybody in the resources sector in this room more generally. Uh, yeah, hi Kevin, uh, Joe Heidel from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, just a general question to you as to what level of modelling has been done, if any, as to the amount of direct and indirect jobs that may have made from such a project. Yeah, we did uh, uh, some, what's the word, direct? <coughs> CGE modelling. I've got a Freudian trouble with that modelling because I really can make a lot of effort to it. We've done some CGE modelling which looks at the opportunities uh, for all of the state and these activities. Um, the details in the report, it's positive. Uh, the impact is uh, about another three quarters of a percent to uh, gross state product. Um, the jobs involved with it, we've also done some modelling on. Um, it's around 1,500 to 4,500 during um, the construction program and about 600 full-time jobs at the end just for this facility. But there are a lot of other activities that we have not modelled. For instance, how do you get the waste here? Um, we've done a little bit of work to think that five to seven ships are necessary. Why wouldn't we build them here? Uh, they've got about 20 year life, so you turn them over reasonably quickly, why would we maintain them here, why would we prove them? There's a lot of training and research activity associated with this as well, which would then flow over to other sectors of the economy. It's very difficult for us at this stage to model that, but we know from looking at overseas how that industry has developed, uh, particularly in places like Canada where we've got similar political and constitutional frameworks. Uh, it's a very vibrant industry in Canada. Um, they are more engaged in the nuclear cycle than what we're reckoning here, but we can see the spin-offs and see the opportunities that they provide. We've also modelled um, the impact on GST. Whilst there would be a reduction in the early years of the GST receipts, they've pretty much returned to uh, the normal 
uh, levels in 20 to 25 years. Again, that details in the annexes in the report. Um, so it is positive, but uh, that CG modelling that goes out many, many years, um, you know, it, it's an indicator. And those numbers are that indicators. We've taken an enormous number of assumptions. We've provided the assumptions. I think the assumptions are conservative. Uh, but all of this is based upon modelling which is looking out 10, 15, 20 years into the future. And because of that, we've added additional contingency so we don't overstate the benefits. Thank you. I just have a question down the front. Um, while the mic's making its way through, um, a number of people have asked questions around skills and jobs, which is a flow on from what you've just been talking about. In particular, what do you think um, South Australia, you've been quite broken, um, should do to kind of be ready for any engagement across the life cycle? There's a, there's a big skill issue involved in this. Firstly, the regulation. Whilst we do have a regulated system here, uh, it would significantly expand the national regulation system. We're not proposing uh, a separate South Australian system. We think it should be part of the natural Australian system. But what we've seen from overseas is the need to lead in to the skills development. So there's a chapter in uh, the report which talks about the investment in skills, you know, five to seven years before the activities commence. We need to build up the skills of the regulators to be able to engage with this. And then we need to build up the skills of those people involved uh, in the facility itself. Uh, there's no reason to think we can't do that. Uh, if you look at what happened when uh, Oval was built in, the, in New South Wales, that's the reactor of Luca sites, there was sufficient Australian expertise to be able to build that facility, to install it, uh, to run it at the moment. We see the need for uh, university courses, uh, that's something that the state can manage, uh, probably uh, master's level courses once you've done basic engineering. All of these skills will be necessary, they'll need to be brought in probably before you start construction so that they can build and, and uh, develop in time ready to regulate and operate the facilities when it's now. Um, I'm pleased to note that the um Upskilling is for everyone in the system, and you know, regulators are an important part of our world, and um, ensuring that we invest appropriately across the board is going to be pretty important. What, when do you think we should start? Do you think the five to seven years before? <laughs> well, I think there's a time scale here. The first part of it is social consent, which is the broad view of government. Yes, we are going to proceed to the next stage. The next stage would be community consent. So that would be saying, in essence, here are six or seven characteristics that we think are necessary to choose the site. And it would be geological stability, um, it would be lack of other resources, because you don't want to be digging in that area once you've um, built your facility. It'll be, um, uh, what are the other issues that we want? So groundwater is very important. Uh, don't want groundwater at the level that uh, you're building this facility. Uh, seismicity is important. And also I think uh, it's important that we don't put it anywhere it compromises the clean green image that the state has <coughs> and should enjoy into the future. It's often been said that this would destroy the image. I suggest you go to France, you go to um, Belgium, you go to Switzerland, look at where these facilities are located, it has not impacted upon their image of fine, word, fine food and fine wine. I don't see why it would impact upon that image in South Australia if the location was uh, appropriate. And that's certainly part of the recommendation. Okay. Uh, Phil Sutherland from the Civil Contractors Federation. Kevin, thanks for your presentation. Very, very informative. Uh, look, uh, you partly answered this question, but I was just wondering what infrastructure will be necessary to support the facility? Well, when, when I talk about, to go back to that slide, okay. 
Now, I think this is a terrific example of how we might open up an area. Whilst I talk about a purpose-built port, rail, road, interim storage and deep geological storage, potentially with an airport, this facility might be purposefully used three to four days a month. There is absolutely no reason why we wouldn't or couldn't or shouldn't use this infrastructure to open up an area. So the purpose-built uh, infrastructure would be the port, um, it would be the interim storage site, which is really a massive step of concrete with all the security around it. Um, and the storage facility, and the storage facility then has to have uh, an ability to build canisters. So these are the small canisters that take the fuel and put it into the ground. Um, we've seen examples overseas. That could be anywhere, because we're building thousands of these canisters. Um, uh, some five to six hundred people engaged in building those canisters or building the big casks. So the casks are where the interim storage facility is. So that infrastructure is also required. They're the things that immediately come off the top of the head. If we were to proceed, I think we would certainly look at building our own transport infrastructure. Um, and all of the opportunities that come from that. Um, there'll be other um, opportunities as well in terms of research, training, <coughs> education. Uh, but that just gives you a sense. It's about 20 odd billion dollars worth of infrastructure. So it's, it's sizable and it's built over 20 odd years. Think about increases of kit and large processes. But what are your thoughts on? Well, I think this lends itself to SME type activity, uh, probably suitably licensed from overseas, um, probably being the, the logical way and, the, and with the least risk, uh, particularly initially. I have to say, we're a way off thinking about that at this stage. Um, we, we need to get to social license, which can take six to nine months. We then have that conversation with the communities. So we put out the characteristics of the sort of geology we're looking for. And then we have a discussion with the community about whether they want to be part of that. It's about involving the community, educating the community, and eventually allowing them to make up their mind as to whether they want to be part of the process. Ideally, you'd like to have two or three communities that are interested. Um, so the regional economic opportunity is going to be a big part of the cost-benefit analysis for any community. I mean, it's sort of part of the social consent. But we understand that everything we do has an impact, <coughs> everything we do has potential risks. But do you feel well placed at the moment to be able to sort of articulate what that would look like from an economic perspective on, on the ground at a regional level? I think we've got plenty of overseas examples to see how that might pan out. Um, one of the principal benefits of this is that the community gets to be part of the process of deciding what it is that it wants. And we've seen that work particularly well overseas in um, uh, in Belgium, for instance, the community that decided uh, to take a uh, medium low level waste facility wanted an ability to go and look at the facility over time to ensure that it was safe. And that was built into the design at their request. They requested a visitor centre, a training centre and additional infrastructure as the benefits that they saw occurring from having a facility on their area. So that was part of the deal. I think that's exactly what we'd be looking for here in the state with communities that are interested, both now and into the longer term. What do they see the benefit 
to their community to be involved in this process, and that would be part of the negotiation. That's how it's worked overseas. Okay. Yes, Hi, uh, David Williams from Mobile Energy. Can I just take you back to the, the electricity generation side? And I, I've got to say, this was one of the areas I dismissed myself early on because South Australia's going kind to of swing generator. Um, but some of your comments earlier about the need to go zero emissions and recognising that base load is our worst emitter, uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, and coal fired generation. And given that we've got a, an interconnected uh, system on the, uh, on the eastern seaboard and into South Australia, did you give any thought to saying, well, it's going to happen, happen somewhere, and typically Victoria, New South Wales, and even Queensland probably don't want it. But like all of these things, if you facilitate it and say, well, you can have it here, and you get all the necessary approvals as you're doing everything else as far as the waste repository is concerned, then ultimately you can start getting that infrastructure, the interconnections at a, at a greater capacity there, and so the opportunity may well come down the track for South Australia uh, to become a base load electricity supplier. Well, we certainly have looked at the prospect of uh, base load supply and interconnections to the other states. Um, it, uh, it didn't economically work at this particular stage, um, but it may well be in five to ten years' time, uh, small modular re reactors, what we're talking about in a, in a normal nuclear reactor is about a gigawatt. Um, I saw only last week where um, I think it was New Scale putting in uh, an application to the American regulator to have one of their small modular reactors uh, going proven. Now that's two to three hundred megawatts. When you're talking about two to three hundred megawatts into the net, into our state system, then that makes sense. But the issue for us in the Commission was no one's licensed it yet. The costs look very expensive per gigawatt per megawatt hour, um, and you don't want to be first trialling this new technology. So whilst we didn't see it fit into the South Australian market, we certainly saw the need to consider nuclear um, as you retire significant uh, coal in Victoria, uh, particularly brand coal in Victoria. Um, but it still didn't work out in terms of transmission to have something on the border that could deliver that bit. It, uh, it didn't stack up in replacing that uh, capacity at the stone. But I think critically for the nation, we need to think about our energy policy. You know, what we have at the moment is a focus on renewables without understanding the reliability of renewables, without understanding the cost of the system, without understanding generation and transmission, sorry, transmission costs. Um, what that means for South Australia is our electricity prices will be 20% higher on average than the other states. So we need to look at the full system cost of the electricity system rather than just one aspect of the generation. Uh, there's a fair amount in the report about that. Probably won't be all that popular, but eventually the nation will have to come to grips with how it's going to manage the transition uh, to zero or near zero emissions by 2050. If we do what we normally do, which is nothing, then we'll have a hell of a step from 2030 to 2050 to reach the target. And I think it's optimistic. I've heard some people say we don't need to because we only have a small fraction of, uh, of the uh, global emissions. I can't see if our trading partners are forced to make change that they're just going to allow us to continue to pollute. So it is something that's going to be on our target. Okay, we've got our last question down the front. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Adrian Pedrick, member for Hammond, and I applaud you for the work you and your group have done. 
I'm just a bit intrigued in why you've gone for the private infrastructure, whereas in Europe, which I've seen recently as well, as they use all the public rail and ports and, and that kind of thing. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think what we've done is trying to take the worst case scenario, so purpose-built infrastructure, purpose-built activity, rather than anticipate that you could use the existing infrastructure. I also think it's a means of growing regional activity. Um, so that was the reason we took it, but certainly there is no reason why you couldn't use existing infrastructure because, as you say, when you go and visit the facilities in uh, Canada or in the UK, they're using just a port, they close the port down for a day, transfer it, and then they get on with life. I just think it's a terrific opportunity to grow this in, in the state, but there's a hell of a lot of work that needs to be done in deciding where it would go and using existing infrastructure is certainly an opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask everyone to put their hands together for a fantastic presentation? such as what the nuclear fuel cycle involves and what it means for Australia. 
does Australia need to consider nuclear energy as part of its future energy mix? And what are the potential environmental impacts of such an endeavour? And what are the alternatives? The format of the public forum will be similar to the popular ABC TV program Q&A, where a moderator will be present to facilitate a discussion on the chosen topics and select the panel members will be present to instigate discussions and answer questions from the audience. It will be facilitated by Dr. Paul Willis from RIOS, um, a well-known science communicator who will moderate that. And the panel consists of six members who have intimate knowledge of the nuclear fuel cycle who have been who have, or who have a vision where our future energy needs will be sourced from and who represent both sides of the nuclear energy argument. More information on the forum can be found from the flyers on your tables and from the web show, website shown on the slide and from Carolyn Forbes. Where are you, Carolyn? Uh, there she is, Carolyn Forbes, uh, who is here today. So if you want to uh, hear more about that, um, please contact Carolyn. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that draws to our close our, uh, our conversation this morning. I appreciate uh, you giving us your time and thank you and have a great day.